When you think of the KKK, you generally think deep south, men wearing white robes and pointy hoods, terrorizing neat black neighborhoods. But there's much more to what we like to think is a fringe movement, as author David Cunningham reports in his new book. The Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1866 in Pulaski, Tennessee, and its principal tenets were white supremacy and anti-immigration. That first movement died out, but another was resurrected in the 1920s using the same rituals and symbols. They were the ones to introduce cross burnings, planted on the lawns of anti-segregation sympathizers. But a more odious group emerged in the 1950s, coincidental with the civil rights movement. This Klan was based in the most liberal of the southern states, North Carolina. And unlike previous Klans, dared to show their faces, often marching in large groups up and down city streets before their various rallies. Even some women joined as auxiliary members, shown here holding donation buckets. The Klan of the Civil Rights Movement was associated with the murders of civil rights workers and the bombings of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The blast killed four young black girls, and justice did not prevail until decades later. All right, and with me now is Brandeis Professor David Cunningham, author of the new book, Klansville, USA, The Rise and Fall of the Civil Rights Era Ku Klux Klan. That is such a hard three words to say, too. Nobody ever says it quite right. Um, uh, well, well, starting with the basics, I guess I was surprised to see that North Carolina was where the roots of the civil rights KKK was. W why North Carolina? Well, that was the question that initially interested me as well, because I, I would have assumed, like most people, that, that the Deep South, which are the cases that we know most of in terms of Klan violence, was, was the Klan's real hotbed and stronghold. But North Carolina, I think, was the predominant Klan state for two reasons. And the first is just because of its leadership. They really had the ingenuity and the capacity to hold large-scale rallies almost every night of the year somewhere in the state. And these rallies would draw hundreds and sometimes thousands of, of of people who were curious or who were sympathetic, but they would be able to come, they'd be able to buy refreshments, they'd be able to buy souvenirs, they'd listen to live music, they'd listen to speakers. The night would end with a large cross burning, and when I say large, 60 or 70 feet in the air, so it was a spectacle. Um, and it was really a, a helpful recruiting tool. Uh, and the second thing that I think mattered was that if you were a committed segregationist in a state like Mississippi or a state like Alabama, you could count on a coordinated response to maintain the status quo from everything from the governor's office on down to local school boards and chambers of commerce. So the Klan had relatively narrow appeal. It was really for people who just felt like violence was the only answer to maintaining the segregationist status quo. Well, well that's the question. Was there mission violence or terror to terrorize people, to make people fearful, or was violence their mission? Well, it's the means were was definitely terror, um, and so violence was became a vehicle to sort of try to maintain its agenda and to meet its goals, and its ends were just to to maintain segregation. Um, so in North Carolina, you'd have a state leadership which was very clear that it did not agree with the Civil Rights Act, but it would abide by the Civil Rights Act. So in a in an environment like that, people who felt like their way of life, white people who felt like their way of life was threatened, uh, really felt like there wasn't anywhere that they could turn. Their governors, their police chiefs, their, their local leaders were just sort of throwing up their hands and saying, well, even though we don't like it, this is what we're going to do. Our, our way of life is going to change. And so the Klan stepped into that void and said, we're the only organization who's going to stand up for your way of life. And so it had much broader appeal in that environment than it did in the deeper south. And you point out that, that there was a lot of music that went on, you know, all this anti-African-American, I mean, it was really vulgar kind of stuff, but they were talking about, did they want to drive black people out of the state or just keep them separate? They, they really wanted to keep them separate. I, I, they, there is a song that, yeah. uh, that was titled, their best known song. They, the Klan had a house band basically called Skeeter, uh, yeah. Skeeter Bob and his country pals. And their, and their uh, best known song was, was titled Move Those Negroes North with a much ruder N-word mm -hmm. in, in that title. Um, and so there was this ethic that um, 
that that wouldn't be a, a problematic kind of outcome. But the point wasn't to get African Americans out of the state. The point of that song was really to show Northern leaders who they felt were on their high horse about how Southerners should treat their racial problems, what it would be like with a huge influx of African Americans. So the idea wasn't necessarily to get them away from them, but to bring them towards people who they felt like were, were uh, affecting Southern ways of life without having to deal with the same kinds of problems. So what was the derivation of the robes and, and the pointy hats? It's, it's something almost buffoonish about it. I mean, yeah. very scary when the hoods are down and the slits, but the, the guys in North Carolina were walking around with these hoods with the flaps open and yep. the, the robes and the almost what the, looks like, a, I don't know what the, the, the insignia is there, but... What was the derivation of all of that? Well, so in North Carolina, as you're noting, there was an anti-masking law. Yes. So they had all the regalia, but their, their faces to, weren't yeah. covered. Um, and and th that derived from the very origins of the KKK. So right after the Civil War in Tennessee and then spreading across most of the rest of the South. Um, what happened back in, so this was in the 1860s, there were origins of, that were really based in folklore. And what the Klan was trying to do was... was uh, prey on people that they saw as simple-minded and superstitious. So these were how they were seeing African Americans at the time. And so a lot of the white robes and the conical hats and hoods and all were based on this idea of being these ghastly specters that could come into the dark of night and do other things like drink enormous quantities of water. It really became sort of theatrical in that way. But all of that symbolism from the hoods onward really was formed in the 1860s and has been maintained since in, in, in the Klan world. You, you talk about the fall. I mean, what happened? Well, the, the Klan's decline was really a policing story in a lot of ways. So in North Carolina, uh, the police had always spoken out against the Klan, but had failed to do anything to proactively or actively hinder their ability to organize. And so what you saw after 1965 is that there were a set of congressional hearings um, that brought more than 200 Klan members and various other people to, in highly visible hearings that were, you know, in the newspapers, the front page of the newspapers every day. And one of the things that came out from that was North Carolina's status as Klansville, USA, was splashed across the newspapers, not just the local papers, but the national papers. And in effect, it became a public relations problem for the state. And so what the governor did after that was immediately appoint an anti-Klan committee. And what you saw from that committee's work is that very quickly there were arrests of Klan members for things like cross burnings and all that had been really ignored prior to that. There were injunctions against the Klan for leasing land to hold their rallies. Uh, courts for the first time were convicting Klan members for racial terror, um, and there was a really dedicated program to insert informants in Klan, in, in, in Klan units that would both let the police know what they were doing, but also disrupt the internal organization of these groups. So what you see once all those things are put in place is the Klan's ability to operate gets greatly hindered. And the press saw this as the Klan was just a laughable organization, yeah. which, which isn't necessarily untrue. But what you really see is that the Klan was quite sophisticated, and it wasn't until it was met by an equally sophisticated response from the police that it was able to, to, to be contained. Now, you actually met some of these characters in researching this book. Robert Shelton, I believe, yes. is his name. He was one of the primary leaders in, in North Carolina. What was that like? And is he still of the same mind? Uh, well, Shel I, I had a chance to speak with Mr. Shelton um, a year before he passed away. So this was 2003. Mm -hmm. He was still of the same mind. He had been the imperial wizard, meaning the national leader of United Clans, since the early 1960s. Um, and he had left the Klan formally in the 1980s because he was sued by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a landmark lawsuit um, that basically put his organization out of business. So he wasn't formally tied to any Klan group. but. Nothing had really changed in terms of his persona. He came and met me, and he spoke as a Klansman. He said the Klan was always a part of his identity. It would be there until the day that he died. Um, and he didn't regret anything that he had done. He thought he'd stood for uh, traditional American values. He was, In his view, he was patriotic. He was Christian. He was anti-communist. All these things that he associated with being 100 percent American. And he spoke proudly of everything he had done and, until the day he died, as far mm -hmm. as I know. I mean, do you see any correlation with some of the extremist politics today to this? 
I think today, when you think about extremism, certainly when you think about race, racial extremism, um, I think it's a much more complicated world where there's a lot of blending of different kinds of groups. In the 1960s, the Klan, neo-Nazis, uh, certain kinds of militia groups, patriot organizations, they all saw themselves as in competition with each other, and they spent a lot of time fighting amongst each other. And I think today it's a much more complicated world where you see a lot of blending between all of these groups and neo-Nazis and Klans forming alliances and all. So the Klan itself has gotten smaller, but its influence, I think, has spread out and expanded and really permeated a lot of these other kinds of So it's still groups. here, in a sense. It is. There are more Klan organizations active now than there ever have been, but most of them are quite tiny and fairly marginal. But their influence, again, has spread into groups that are broader and, and have much more purchase. I guess what I was getting at, though, I mean, you didn't look at what just happened in London this week, this sort of, you know, it, that's being called terror, but it's really a hate, it, f it felt like a hate, you know, anti-American, yeah, yeah. uh, anti you know, or, or in it, oftentimes here it's anti-Muslim. I mean, it has the same kind of basis. Yeah. So I, I agree that, that I think its roots are very similar and its acts are very similar, its means are very similar. So you see the tragedy of violence that attacks either individuals or sometimes communities that people oppose. But I think there's also a distinction between what the Klan was trying to do and, and was successful at for a time in the 1960s where it was an organized act of vigilantism that really tried to say not that they opposed the communities they existed in, but they spoke for the true values of those communities. And so unlike when you see acts of terror now, you often see this opposition. And I think while the violence is tragic, what you see that's quite inspiring, I think, and we certainly know this in Boston, is the unified mm -hmm. response, the solidarity within the community to say that we won't stand for this. We're stronger than this. It took a while for North Carolina to do that. <laughs> exactly. And I think part of it is the, the tragic legacy of the Klan is that when the Klan's organized in this way is that it really rips apart the fabric of the community. Mm -hmm. It delegitimizes the leadership. It sort of divides people in terms of what the community's values really are. And to this day, you see higher levels of violent crime in communities where the Klan was active mm -hmm. in the South than where it wasn't active. So you see this long legacy of their action. All right. David Cunningham, Klansville, USA. Okay. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it.